So today I'm going to be cleaning for another of my relatives. As you can see here, there's lots to do, so I'm going to be splitting these videos by room. And we're just going to be working on the kitchen today. Of all the rooms in the house, I decided kitchen was top priority. For obvious reasons, a clean kitchen makes life so much easier. It's hard to find the will to prepare anything wholesome or nutritious when the counters are cluttered and everything's just in the way. Anyway, today we're cleaning for my dad. I'm just giving you a little tour of the kitchen here before we get started. And then I'm going to tell you more about him. As you've probably gathered from the many messes that happen in my own house, and from the video where you saw me clean my auntie's house, this kind of messiness seems to be hereditary. And some of us just drew the short straw. I say it all the time, but keeping a tidy space most definitely does not come naturally to everybody. And so as you watch this video, I ask you to keep an open mind and put any judgement you have on the back burner. Those are dog paw prints on the counter there. But yeah, we're all so different and we're all just trying to get through life as best we can. Now, my dad was at work while I did this clean. He started at 5am in the morning and finished at 4. So I worked as hard as possible to get as much done as I could and get it looking welcoming and livable by the time he got home. I think people can be quick to assume that people with messy houses are just lazy. But this isn't the case for everybody and it couldn't be further from the truth when it comes to my dad. He works rotating shifts that change every week earlys, mids and night shifts. And when he gets home, with what little time he has left, he works on his art. He wants so much to make his mark in this world and I've never seen someone work so tirelessly. Here's his workstation here. But he's constantly coming up with new ideas and new ventures. Here's all my cleaning supplies, by the way. I'm going to be using this box as a storage unit for my dad. But yeah, when he comes home from work, he prioritises art and I don't blame him. And lucky for him, he's got a daughter that likes to make cleaning videos. That's my art. So I'm practised at cleaning big messes fast. And I can take some of the pressure off in that respect. So he's able to come home from work, make dinner, work out and then work on his art. In a nice, calming environment. And it was my absolute pleasure to be able to help a person who always goes out of his way to help me. We're using some Dr Magic on the plug hole there because it was completely blocked. I had to leave that for an hour so I worked on getting everything off the counters so I could clean. But yeah, my dad's probably the biggest reason I am who I am today. And I'm going to be talking about that a lot in today's video. About the influential people in my life. The people who made me me. But first, let's get started on tackling this space. Because the mess was so overwhelming, I had to come up with a game plan. Otherwise it would have been hard to know where to start. So I thought the best course of action was to get everything that's cluttering the counters onto the floor and just clean those counters. That way we can then go through the stuff and see what actually needs to be on the counter and what we can put away and what we can throw away. Just that simple act of clearing the counter, even though the mess was just transferred somewhere else at that point, made the task seem so much more doable. And that's pretty much what I did throughout the entirety of this clean. Did you see that Frankenstein scrub daddy, by the way? I found that in b and I was so happy. It's the little things. But yeah, I just broke it up into small, manageable tasks. I didn't focus on what was next or how much more I had left to do. I just put my attention on doing the best job I could possibly do on that one small task. This really helps when you've got a massive, overwhelming job ahead of you. Like Martin Luther King Jr. said, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. You can make it to any destination if you keep putting one foot in front of the other. Here I was just scraping out the grime from the sides of the oven. I must say this was one of my favourite things to do. I love the gross stuff and making really messy things look brand new again. Although the grime seemed to never end. And I was worried about perforating the rubber seal. So there was still probably quite a lot left in there. But I made it look a lot better than it did. And that was one of my main goals here. Same as when I cleaned my auntie's. It was making things look better. Because I had a limited amount of time, I wasn't going to focus on organising the cupboards or cleaning the inside of the microwave or anything like that. I wanted to work on the visible aspects of the room because my ultimate goal was improving my dad's mental health and giving him a calming space to go about his day. I told myself if I did have any extra time at the end, of course I was going to go through the cupboards, clean the fridge maybe, but only if I had time. By the way, if you like watching these kinds of cleans... I'm going to put this video and the video of my auntie's house clean into a playlist. And hopefully I can add to it with many other videos, both of their houses and of other people who need the help. Not everyone can afford help with cleaning, and I know I'm only one person, but I want to be able to do my bit. The messiness that can come along with mental health problems, and especially things like ADHD, is an issue that's very close to my heart. 
It's something I've dealt with all of my life and something I've watched a lot of my loved ones live through. It's something that's really misunderstood. And it's difficult to be misunderstood yourself, but it's even harder to watch people misunderstand your loved ones. Especially because of the personality traits that are automatically associated with being messy. Slovenly, unintelligent, unambitious, unkind. These are the images that your mind might conjure when you think of a messy person. And I want to flip that on its head. Us human beings are so complex and our value as people and our morals don't hinge on whether we're tidy or messy. Never allow yourself to believe you're less than because you struggle with keeping on top of your house. We all struggle with something or another, it's just some things are more visible than others. And some people are more vocal about it. Anyway, I'm going to go on a little ramble now about my parents and my childhood. And maybe give some context as to why my dad's house looks the way it does and why mine looks the way it does. And why I'm so passionate about some of the things I discuss in my videos. When it comes to the subject of neurodivergence, I think me and my brother were given a double dose. Look at all that grime that came out of there. But yeah, although my parents are not diagnosed, they're both riddled with symptoms. In my dad's case, for example, two very prominent ones are executive dysfunction and hyperfixation. I'm exactly the same. I hyperfixate on things and so did my granddad, my dad's dad. And this blinkered vision is what causes the mess. It's both a blessing and a curse because I also think that's why he's so brilliant and creative. And he is brilliant. My dad is an extremely talented man. I could make this whole video just about the things my dad can do. He taught himself to play the guitar. I remember as a child being absolutely enamoured when he'd play Spanish romance. I just thought it was the most beautiful sound in the world. But yeah, just taught himself to do that. He's a fantastic painter, writer, he's self-published books. He even made an app. He literally, all by himself, made an app. And it cost him two years of his social life and a lot of his eyesight because he was staring at editing software almost 24-7. He's written and produced songs, all in his bedroom, all by himself. But a big hurdle he faces is he's so meticulous and such a perfectionist that these projects happen at a snail's pace. I'm talking they take years. Because he'll go over things over and over again with a fine tooth comb whilst at the same time coming up with new ideas and new ways to do things and these things will send him on tangents and it can be very frustrating to watch because all I see is brilliance and all he sees are the tiny little things that are wrong. I remember when he was making his app, it was an app for mental health full of daily affirmations and he'd spent weeks gathering the perfect affirmations, the perfect sounds, spent ages designing the logo and then he went on to voice over these affirmations. He turned his cupboard under the stairs into a sound room, covered all of the walls in egg boxes. And then after he'd finished and inputted all of the voiceovers into the computer, he'd go over editing and editing out any little bit of background noise that he thought he'd heard, which honestly couldn't be heard by any other human ears. And yeah, in total it took him two years. Not many people saw that app and it's no longer on the app store. And for someone to plan so much and to put so much of their heart and soul into something, so much of their time and it barely be recognised. It makes my heart hurt. But the brilliant thing about my dad is he never gives up. He constantly picks himself up and tries new things and tries again. He isn't the only member of our family with massive creative and intellectual talent either. Our entire family is full of brilliant people who haven't reached anywhere near their own potential. And I'm going to talk about why I think that is in a minute. But yeah, the family's full of great singers, great artists. My brother, his brain's a magical thing. You could point out any country on a map and ask him where it is, and he could tell you the name of the country, its history, its politics, conflicts, culture. It's truly fascinating to witness. He wanted to be a journalist for a very long time, but he's been held back by a massive fear of certain social situations. He has crippling embarrassment, crippling anxiety, and so all of that knowledge and love for the subject isn't being put to use. And it's just the biggest shame, because he's so passionate and he has a lot of insight. Anyway, a common line I often get when I try and discuss it with my dad, neurodivergence that is, is usually, well, everyone's like this to a certain extent. And it's just like, no, no they're not. I don't think he likes to be labelled or put into a box. And I don't think he likes the idea of using it as a shield or an excuse. Which I understand, but the thing is, knowing these things about yourself allows you to move into a place of acceptance and understanding about any setbacks you might have had throughout your life whether that be educational, social, financial or familial. 
Because like I said earlier, these things are hereditary and the difficulties that come along with neurodivergence, such as addiction, poverty, social impediments, they can be passed through the generations like a curse. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more later on. But first, let's look at what we're doing here again now. So I finished washing every single pot and glass in the house. I didn't film that all though, because I was very conscious about the amount of storage space I had left in my phone. But in total, I did about three more loads of pot washes. And then I had to try and figure out where everything was going to go. Because just like my cupboards at home, my dad's drawers and cupboards were all rammed full. Luckily, I preempted this though. And I bought that big storage box to put some of the overflow items into. And then I got to work on making this little portion of the kitchen look cosy. Just because I thought if I give myself a sneak peek at what the rest of the kitchen might look like completed, it might give me a boost of motivation to carry on, because I did start lagging a few hours in. Anyway, back to what I was saying about the conversations I've had with my dad about the impact of neurodivergence. Him and I differ slightly in opinion when it comes to the topic. He believes that any disadvantages he might have had in life were purely down to the financial situation of his family, and most especially, the attitudes of the people around him as he grew up. My mum has similar thoughts on her upbringing too and feels she should have been encouraged more in her education and given a lot more affection. And this definitely shows in the way that they made very intentional and conscious decisions in their own parenting. And while I don't disagree with what they're saying, I think the subject is more nuanced and has many more layers to it. And I think I probably feel this way because I've had access to the things they wish they'd have had access to. They raised me and my brother to recognise the importance of education and expanding your horizons. And we were given so much love and encouragement. I won't lie, there were some very hard parts too, especially when it comes to my parents' separation. And my mum and brother's relationship was tumultuous at best. But that's a story for another day. Just got to interrupt myself here and say, look how cosy and welcoming this looks. And yeah, we weren't well off, but we never had to struggle. We were given opportunities to learn different skills, music, dance, martial arts. We were able to travel to different countries on holiday and see that there was more out there. And we were encouraged to be social. We were always taken to different clubs and events. Constantly put into situations where we were exposed to meeting new people. And yet, despite all that, we've still faced incredible social hurdles. Hurdles in education and hurdles in the workplace. I remember when I was a kid, I did ballet and I was really good at it. But I was so cripplingly shy that the very thought of going to each session filled me with dread. Like a dread I can't even explain because I couldn't cope with the idea of being observed. Eventually, I convinced my parents to stop taking me and looking back now, I wish so badly I hadn't. It's an absolute miracle I got my degree. Because of executive dysfunction issues, I used to complete all of my written work, essays, contextuals, all of it, the night before because I could not no matter how much I tried do things bit by bit over time everything was a last minute panic I used to hand in my work folder in one hand and sick book it in another because I'd made myself physically ill doing an all-nighter to get it done the only way I could complete my work was through the pressure of an imminent deadline and you see the effects of this even today when you watch my videos when people ask me how do you let your house get so messy how does it get so messy so quick well, it's because I struggle with doing a little bit, often. Usually, I can only get motivated when there's a big mess to tackle at the end of the day. Everyday things like housework and sometimes even brushing my teeth are things I have to fight really hard to do. And that's not something most people have to deal with, really. Having to convince yourself to brush your teeth every day. It's exhausting and almost impossible to explain to people. Throughout most of my childhood, I kept these struggles inside. I masked. And being a child, having parents there to organise the majority of my day, meant my problems with executive dysfunction weren't really apparent. Not as apparent as they quickly became after I moved out and started having to organise things for myself. But yeah, that, and the fact that I was getting good grades consistently despite it all, why would anyone have had a reason to believe I was struggling to keep my head above water 90% of the time? My brother can't keep a job. He suffers so badly with social anxiety and communicating that he's been let go from every job he's had. He's tried to be a bin man and he couldn't match their energy in conversation. He worked in a kitchen but wasn't fast enough for them. And he's pretty much given up trying because it is so demoralising for him to put himself out there again and again and keep getting rejected. And this is what I mean by genetic factors being passed down. This is not just a consequence of environment. 
This is a deep-rooted difference in personality that not only impacts how you see the world, but how the world sees you. Did you know that just 22% of autistic people are in employment? And this ties in really importantly with what I'm going to tell you about later on. I gave up on and missed out on so many opportunities and experiences because of being quote unquote shy and feeling like I didn't fit in and didn't belong. My brother even more so than me. And he unfortunately is still dealing with the consequences of having to feel this way. I remember once I was late for my English A-level exam. And at age 18, knowing the full consequences of not taking this exam, I could not bring myself to open that door and walk past everybody to find my seat. So I just missed my exam. After all of the hard work I'd put in, just flunked it straight away and flushed my opportunity down the toilet because I did not want to walk past my own classmates. The thought just made me so viscerally uncomfortable, I wanted the ground to swallow me up. I would have done anything not to go into that room. At that point in my life, I was so hyper aware of myself in whatever space I was in, and I always felt like an imposter. I, after a lot of hard work, have been able to move now, at 30, into a space where I feel confident and comfortable in my own skin. And that didn't just miraculise out of thin air, or at a certain age. It was from pushing myself out of my comfort zone and repeatedly exposing myself to situations that made me feel uncomfortable. And you know what? That is because of the environment I was raised in and it is because of my parents' influence. So yes, in part, my dad is very correct. But what I hate to do in the conversation is downplay the extra hurdles that being neurodivergent can put in your path. It suggests that everybody's on a level playing field when it comes to how their brain works, and it's just not true. The point I always try to make is you could have two different people from the same household, one autistic, ADHD, and another neurotypical. That neurotypical person, despite being raised in the same environment with the same parents, same opportunities, same household finances, would still be at a massive advantage. I don't like to negate and downplay those extra struggles. And I want to acknowledge and almost shout from the rooftops how hard some people have worked to overcome. Sometimes, even now, as someone who puts herself out there and shares her inner world with thousands of people, sometimes, when I walk my son into the school playground, I find it hard to raise my head and look at other parents. Parents I know fairly well, by the way. Especially if they're in large groups and chatting among themselves, I find it very uncomfortable to look up and catch their eye. I just keep my head down, get in and get out. And I know full well how that comes across. Antisocial, aloof, arrogant. And yet on the other hand, from conversations in person, they'll know me as friendly and welcoming and oddly charismatic. That's a hard thing to explain to people. I usually just turn it into a joke and say, oh, I'm not a morning person. But yeah, so when me and my dad talk, it's often only about the circumstances he was raised in and the attitude he was raised around, and not a possible root cause of why that attitude might have been so dominant and pervasive, and something that's endured through many different generations. But I understand. I think he feels very sad when he thinks about all the things he could have been, had he been given more opportunity and had he been exposed to more. And I'm sure this is how a lot of people feel, especially in today's world, where we're having to navigate such a stifling economy. It can feel like we're giving every second of our lives away working for the bare minimum. And how can you strive and work towards a better situation when you aren't given any free time to do so? My dad works in a factory to make ends meet. And like I said before, he gets very little free time to do the things he actually loves. I know he'd love to make a living from his art but it's so difficult when you're fighting every day to keep your head above water financially and in many other ways. This is why when he comes home, he focuses on his creative projects and not cleaning. I know something that weighs very heavily on his mind is the wasted potential of some of his brothers, some of whom are in their 40s, jobless, have never left the nest and who spend all of their time in their old childhood bedrooms. It's upsetting. And I think for dad, this is even more motivation to prioritise art over household chores. We talk about the fact that we often mirror the people we spend the most time around. And if we spend most of our time around people who don't want more for themselves, even despite being in poverty, say, then this is something that can be passed on from parent to child and so on and so forth. And it can become a cycle that's hard to break out of. Knowing what I told you earlier about being from a family full of amazing talent, it can be very difficult to watch the people you love do nothing with it. And even more than that, watch them not even seem to want to. 
But you see, I don't think this is the case. I think it's more than likely a case of resignation, of not having the tools to process your inner world and implement that in the real world, of not knowing where or how to start and finding comfort in where it's safe and constant, even if that constant isn't especially healthy. And I think I have this perspective because I'm fairly certain that had I not been lucky enough to possess this one personality trait, that I'd be in a totally different situation than I am today. But I, set against some of my more debilitating features, have been blessed with a huge dose of optimism. Unwavering optimism. And I've always known that whatever the problem, there's a solution. Whatever hurdles in front of me, it can be overcome. And I always had this inner confidence, even despite my struggles socially, and even despite the many times that I quit and gave up, that it wouldn't always be this hard. And that at some point down the line, I would change my path and I'd make something of myself. I think hope and optimism is genetic too. I see it in my dad, who was the first in his family to get a degree, who made an app, who produces music and who never ever gives up. And I don't know, maybe that's the secret ingredient. Maybe that's why some people seem to thrive in spite of the setbacks and some people succumb to them. Hope. When I think about the family my dad grew up in, there were a lot of people, not everyone, but most didn't really spend time with people outside of the family circle. They were very visibly uncomfortable when interacting with people they didn't know. That's something I picked up on even as a child. Their daily routines were also very predictable and didn't often change. Affection wasn't something that was openly expressed, even though I know there was so much love. There was quite a lot of negativity and an unusually high instance of addiction. And knowing what I now know about neurodiversity, well... I think you catch my drift. I sometimes ponder whether things could have been different had they known that things like autism and ADHD might have been the culprits and the reason why they found certain things so difficult. I know a feeling that I'm sure a lot of you can relate to is that you were born onto a planet that didn't seem to be designed for you, that you didn't feel like you belonged. And I think information about neurodiversity, especially when it's high functioning, wasn't something that was readily available and it still isn't today really. When it comes to high-functioning ND adults, I think a lot more compassion is needed and a lot less frustration and exasperation. Because to the rest of the world, you can present and come across as neurotypical. And this can distract from the fact that this is still an incredibly debilitating cognitive disorder. And I've gone on yet another tangent there. But had they known, tools and healthy coping mechanisms might have been more readily available. Because they were for me. And I owe that all to my parents and their strength and determination. The discussions we had, the books I was given to read, the way they masked and clawed their way through each day to try and improve their own quality of life. It left an impression on me. I may not have been aware of it until way into my 20s, but it's the reason I'm the biggest advocate of modelling the behaviour you wish to see in your own children. My parents to me are the most impressive humans. Throughout my childhood, I've watched my parents develop and sustain habits and methods of self-soothing, whether that be consciously or just through the trials and error of day-to-day life. But these things have allowed them to move through the world despite carrying with them a lot of internal struggle. And these are things I've taken on and tried to implement in my own life. And I just wanted to share them with you. For context, and without going into too much personal detail, and reiterating that this is just speculation on my part, I believe my dad has ADHD, he's the most like me. My mum, ASD, she's the most like my brother who's diagnosed with autism. And I think my stepdad has OCD. From the age of eight onwards, I lived with my mum and my stepdad and I saw my dad on the weekends. And as a very messy and spaced out child, I'm sure you can imagine that my childhood was interesting. I always say in my other videos that I didn't realise that there were other people in my family who were like me, my dad, my auntie, my granddad. And that's in terms of the messiness. It would have been nice to know because I felt very alone. But anyway, back to what I was trying to tell you. Over the years, my dad has cultivated a daily routine that he rarely breaks. A lot of people would probably call it obsessive and quite regimented. And it's often to the detriment of other areas of his life, such as his house, as you've seen. But I think it's because he knows the downward spiral that would occur if he let go of the reins. And so even if he's worked a 12-hour shift, he still makes time to, one, work out, And two, work on his creative projects. And he learned the importance of this discipline as a young man through reading about self-help, about habits, about how the brain works. He also studied martial arts and I think this made an impression on him about how important it is to master your inner world. 
And you know what? In my 30 years of life, I have never once seen that man lose his cool. Never once. My mum, again, works ridiculously long shifts. She saves lives, and obviously this work takes its toll emotionally. So outside of work, she spends her time in nature and in her allotment, growing flowers and food. And she's transformed her home into this maximalist haven of unusual trinkets and cosy lights. She's forever collecting stuff. And she's a big fan of planning different events and trips out to spend together. Because she knows how vital it is in this world to make memories and have things to look forward to. And to live in a home that's good for your soul. My stepdad keeps himself busy. I truly believe that man can conjure a job that needs to be done out of thin air. I rarely see him sit down and rest in his free time. And that free time is few and far between, by the way, because he, again, works very hard at his job. He's constantly going out of his way to help people. Acts of service is definitely how he shows love. And I think it's because feeling productive and feeling accomplished in completing tasks is very important for his mental well-being. And on the rare times he does sit down to rest, well, then he's earned it and he can savour it. Anyway, the takeaway I have from observing my dad is to find a routine that works for you and stick to it. I know personally when I fall out of routine my whole life quickly descends into chaos. I need the stability of it. Another is to always have a passion and something to work on creatively. It's good for self-worth and vitality. One of the biggest things I've learned is to never stop learning and to always question everything. From my mum I learned that home is the scaffolding that holds everything else up. So make it cosy and make it yours. Ambient lighting makes everything better. Spend time in nature every day and ground yourself. Go barefoot and let your feet touch the mud. And don't be so rigid in your habits that you forget to break them for a day spent making memories. From my stepdad, I learned that you can find purpose in the everyday stuff too. The cleaning, the boring stuff. Because it makes you feel in control of your day and proud. And I learned to always make time in your life to commit to the service of others. Community is important and helping other humans is important. Life can't be full if you don't. And this is why I'm so passionate and enthusiastic about what I do on this channel. Specifically in terms of keeping house and developing methods of cleaning that work for people who are wired a bit differently. Because I do firmly believe that the home, which is meant to be our safe place, is the foundational structure in which every other aspect of our life hinges on. When we have control over our space, we feel more confident and content and ready to take on any other challenges we might face. So I'll make these videos for people who find simple daily tasks like tidying to be very overwhelming. I most definitely am one of those people, and I don't think that's ever going to change. But these are things that most people see as everyday and quite easy, if not a little bit monotonous and annoying. I think that's a universal experience. But there are those of us out there who find these things to be such a battle that it severely impacts our day-to-day lives in a way that we struggle to articulate to others. Trying to explain that you want to tidy your house, that the mess is making you anxious, and yet you're frozen on the spot with overwhelm, well, that can be very embarrassing because it sounds so ridiculous. And it can generate a lot of shame. As can trying to explain to people why cleaning as you go doesn't work for you. When you're met with the inevitable, well, how did you let it get this bad in the first place? For people like me, it's so frustrating and so embarrassing to try and explain this thing over and over again to someone you know isn't going to understand. So I want to be here to be able to walk and talk people through these tasks and show them that they're not the only ones who find things like this difficult. I think just knowing you're not alone means so much. It would have meant the world to me. Anyway, if you've managed to get this far into the video and listen to all of my rambling, thank you so much. I know it's been a bit of a different one, but I hope still enjoyable. It's been a difficult one to voice over and it's probably taken the longest amount of time to put out of any of my videos so far because it is so personal. And so I hope it goes without saying that I've left out a lot of important and more upsetting details. And please bear in mind that the man behind this clean is my absolute hero. And so while I will happily take insults on my own videos, I won't tolerate them on this one. Anyway, so I managed in the nick of time to clean out the fridge, put on some cosy candles. I picked a nice autumny smell because I just think they're the most comforting. I bought some cute little lights that I thought went with this fruit bowl. Obviously filled the fruit bowl because I couldn't leave that empty. And then my final thing to do was mop the floor and I just started when my dad arrived so I didn't feel much of that. There was this big brown stain that I kept going over and over and I couldn't get rid of it. And then my dad was like, oh yeah, you're not going to get rid of that, that's wax. And it had spilled everywhere when he was making a model for one of his projects. He actually burnt the side of his face and down his chest, it was quite bad. He had to go to hospital and have it treated. 
but that's what that was anyway. So I couldn't get the floor to look as clean as I was hoping it would have looked, but I am still so chuffed with how much I managed to get done. I had some true crime on in the background, and my brother and his basset hound Smithers kept popping down to keep me company. He had to keep Smithers upstairs because he's into everything and he's an absolute menace. A cute one though. Here's that stain I was talking about, by the way. And yes, I did bleach the sink after this. I know people hate this, but my dad does his washing up in that purple bowl anyway, so... Here's me keeping on going over the same spot before my dad came home and told me. And yeah, what else did we do? I got a nice little storage rack for all of his spices so they weren't just all over the counter. And yeah, I'll show you around the finished kitchen now and let me know what you think. As always, we're not about perfection, just doing what we can. And when I come back to do the next clean here, I'll be doing dad's living room, which is messy in a completely different way. So make sure you keep your eyes peeled for that one. And here we are, a nice cosy kitchen. Thank you so much for watching. I hope if you're watching the video, you got some motivation. And if you're one of the people that are just here for the voiceovers, I hope it meant something to you in some way. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see you in the next one.